Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Rethink podcast. My name is Owen Gaffney and with me today is a truly remarkable scientist. He is Carl Fulke, the Stockholm Resilience Centre's co-founder and chair of the board. Carl's own path to resilience thinking is unique. Instead of stepping into his family's successful building company, he chose a career in academia. After earning a degree in business and economics, he became fascinated by the connections between society and nature. Through his PhD studies and beyond, Carl was inspired by systems ecologists such as Anne-Marie Janssen, Buzz Holling and the Odom brothers, but also economists like Kenneth Balding and Herman Daly. These were the pioneering thinkers about how an expanding global economy can operate within a finite biosphere. Carl, or Calais as he's known to friends and colleagues, has built on this work to become one of the most cited scientists, not just in ecological economics, but in academia. He has 175,000 citations, according to Google Scholar. In addition to his work at the Stockholm Resilience Centre, Kalle is also the director of the Bayer Institute for Ecological Economics at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and the Royal Swedish Academy. He has received numerous awards and recognitions over the years. Kale, welcome to our podcast. Thank you very much, Uwen. Really nice to be with you. So much of your work and many of your talks start with the biosphere. What is the biosphere? It's a beautiful place. Uh, it's, it's just a thin layer of about 20 kilometers around our planet. And that's where life exists. Uh, the only life that we know of in the, in the way we knew it, in this immense universe, that's fantastic. A uh, universe that is so big that you can't grasp it mentally, with several millions and billions of galaxies. We have one galaxy, the Milky Way, and with several hundred billions of stars, with the sun as one star, and the sun having couple of round planets circulating it and uh, Earth is one and Earth happens to have this biosphere. It's not by chance, it's, it's, it has been an emergence of life uh, in a beautiful way as a complex adaptive system and since it's about life it's also about our life and we are part of it, dependent on it and living in it and embedded in it, and it is indeed our home. It's nothing else than our only home. And so, and within this biosphere, we have a global economy that has been expanding over the last few uh, few centuries, particularly the last few decades. H- how do you think about the economy and the biosphere? Yeah, the, to me, the economy. Uh, and society and all of us are embedded in the biosphere, we're part of it, we're living in it. It's not something that is external to society or a sector that we deal with when we want to. Uh, I think sometimes the climate issue is looked upon as a sort of separate issue that that if we fix that we can go on living as before, but we sort of have lost the the, the, uh, obvious insight that we are part of the planet and living on it and dependent on it. But I think we are rapidly gaining that perspective again. Uh, And of course, as you said, uh, we're now in the Anthropocene uh, era or epoch where where we as humans have amazingly expanded into global force. If you look at my lifetime, I was born in the mid 50s, uh, 1950s, the great acceleration of us has happened since then into into a lot of beautiful things, uh, much more health, uh, well-being and material living standards for most people on Earth, although there are several people still uh, without it. Uh, and that's a, an amazing uh, world with, with a globalized society. Uh, but it also means that that huge expansion has now started to uh, 
sort of carve out the resilience of the planet that we are dependent on. And it's, and it's challenging, starting to challenge our own future. So, so the bottom line here is actually that you can't think about people as one thing and nature as another, or because we are completely interwoven, intertwined in a web of very complex relations from the local up to the global and to the planet as a whole. So, and you mentioned resilience here, and obviously that's a, a core part of the, the work at the centre. Um, can you define what what you mean by by resilience in this this big global uh, biosphere context? I could start saying that resilience is not what many people think of it as just bouncing back or or uh, going back to what we were before, some type of recovery. That's not how we use it. We look at it as a capacity, a, a capacity to live with changing circumstances, whether they are predictable or unknown, or truly unknown unknowns, uh, and 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 fast or slow. And we are especially interested in looking at resilience as the capacity to live with both abrupt change, but also slow changing circumstances. Uh, basically to to live and develop with change having that capacity so you know what what drives you as a researcher as you, as you said you know you um you're born in the 50s then at the start of this great acceleration and you know your career has gone through um you know seen huge changes physical biophysical changes to the planet um so how what drives you as a researcher and how has your thinking evolved over the last few few decades? Um, just to, you know, talk us through uh, your, your eureka moments. Yeah, I, I started back in the early 80s with, uh, with my PhD, 84 I think it was, and, and, and um, uh, I was I started business and economics and administration first, but I was really interested in how we work, how the planet works actually. And I think I'm driven by truly understanding what's going on in the world, and I felt that that combination between the planet we're living on and the society we are developing was poorly investigated and poorly understood at those times actually. So I was lucky to get in contact with a woman called Anne-Marie Olsen, who was leading a group that were trying to connect ecology and economics. And um, and I did my master's with her, actually. And I think it probably was the first ever quantification of what is now called ecosystem services or nature's contribution uh, to society or to people uh, of, of a wetland in, in one island in the Baltic Sea called Gotland where we try to quantify the values and uh, the benefits and, uh, of ecosystem services for people uh, on, that, on that island. And that was a very new thing at that, those days. And uh, I remember we had people from Stockholm School of Economics coming to the master uh, presentation and people from, from biology department be very, very upset that we may try to make these links and so on and so forth. So, so you're, you're really right, Owen, at that time it was a big gap between people who were doing natural sciences and people who were living in uh, the world of economics. Actually, when we started ecological economics in in the mid-late 80s uh, as an area, we had it as a slogan that that uh, ecologists were pretending as there are no people around and economists are pretending as there is no, no nature around, actually. And, and to some extent that is still true, but I think it has changed radically since then. And, and I was lucky to, after my thesis, which focused on, on life support, or what Eugene Odom had called life support ecosystems for you, humans, actually. Uh, so you could say that I started with really trying to understand, uh, to look at ecosystems as a capital that uh, generates uh, goods and services. And, and the reason for using goods and services, uh, that was Paul, Paul Ehrlich's and John Holdren's invention, was to, to highlight that nature is not just a store of resources that you pick and exploit, but actually provides a lot of services from climate regulation to pollination of crops to water purification and lots and lots of other things. Uh, and 
and um, he he used the term ecosystem services to uh, since the, we we measured economic progress in in economic goods and services. So that's the origin of the of the, of the concept, you could say. So from from going from understanding ecosystems, we got more into the how do you manage them. But then, since the realization happened that people are a part of ecosystems, we really looked at how do we govern people as part of ecosystems. And not just people to people, but people with nature, actually. And that's, that led to the whole idea of social ecological systems, which uh, we developed after I started at the Bayer Institute. And the Bayer Institute, I think, was completely instrumental for many of those topics, and I think for a lot of what's going on in the world today, because when we started in the early 90s, it was one of the few spaces or platforms that uh, brought together uh, leading social scientists, we leading natural scientists, and especially uh, ecologists, actually. Uh, so so uh, that space was just tremendously important for the emergence of many of the topics that actually not only we, but a lot of people in the world are working on, on today. So, so, so that a little bit is a little bit of my background, going from understanding ecosystem dynamics to to actually actually doing footprint analysis. Also, I think we were one of the earliest in the mid '80s, but we were not smart enough to call it ecological footprints. We call it appropriated ecosystem areas, uh, basically to try to find out how large uh, space uh, that is required to produce a good or a service from nature. And we applied that to start to apply to aquaculture and to wetlands and many other other ecosystems to show that humans are heavily dependent on on the work of nature. And we did it in '97, I think we did it for cities where we looked at all the big cities in the world, how much they need from uh, support they need from ecosystems uh, just through resources and services and and some of the waste assimilation capacities. So, so a lot of those concepts and ideas, uh, I was lucky to be part of groups that invented those, like investing in natural capital or, or ecosystem services, footprints, and all these stuff. Yeah, and and you also go into um, other areas too. You know, um, it, macroeconomics and uh, impact on the biosphere and behavioral psychology. Um, uh, you had a, a paper with colleagues in science uh, a couple of years ago, uh, looking at you know at that kind of micro level, um, you know, uh, consumer behaviour and um, and nudging and uh, uh, these kind of um, uh, uh, you know policy interventions that can uh, can change behaviour at scale as well. So um, it's almost like uh, you know, you're totally unbounded in um, in what you what you're interested in and want to look at. Yeah, you're right, because we're looking at the challenges and problems and try to understand what's going on. And that means that you're not constrained by a certain discipline or by a certain theory or method. You try to bring together people who can really collaborate and are excited about figuring out new things that have not been seen before. And the biggest success is when you, when you do that. And when they are seen, they become so obvious that everyone thinks they have been seen all the time. To, that that's, to me is a, is a big success. I, I was lucky, of course, that we also started to work with a lot of people from uh, dealing with institutions uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, mid, uh, mid -90s, uh, because uh, at the same time as ecological economics developed, there was also another society, or International Association for the Study of Common Property Resources, or uh, Common Pool Resources, as it, as it is called today. So that's how I got to know Fikir Berkis and Eleanor Ostrom and many of the others, and, and that connects to what you just talked about, uh, when with with uh, with norms, the rule, rules of the norms and rules of the game, the, the institutions. And early on, I worked a lot on traditional and indigenous societies to uh, to try to figure out how they were governing uh, and managing uh, ecosystem services uh, with a with a entry point that. If they have survived for thousands of years without fossil fuel technologies or capital markets, what did they do in relation to the ecosystem that made this survival possible? And, that, and, and the first work, work was published in a book in 98 called Linking Social and Ecological Systems, uh, where, we, where we used a lot of case studies from all over the world to draw out 
and basic understanding and basic principles of this type of management and governance practices. So, so that, that was very exciting. And I think, uh, of course, a lot of that work on, on norms, both formal norms and informal norms. I think for informal norms, I, I did work with colleagues on on uh, sacred groves, for example, or, or uh, a lot of oral-based traditions that created uh, links between people uh, of how, how you behave. And uh, so that's a that's a long tradition we have worked with for a long time on both norms and how they are also developed into formal rules in society. And then in 2007, you founded the Stockholm Resilience Centre uh, with um, your friend and colleague, uh, Johan Rockström. Can you talk us through the origin story of the centre? Yeah, that's a... That's a great thing. You, you one, uh, as you may know, he did his PhD in my research group at the uh, uh, small research group we had at Systems Ecology called Natural Resource Management. And uh, he was away uh, working with uh, water harvesting in, in uh, Africa. And uh, Marlin Falkenmark, his supervisor, and I really want to get him back. So we were successful in getting him back to become director of the Stockholm Environment Institute. And uh, when he started there, we we there was a call from one of the Swedish research councils on uh, on center of excellence and and uh, Johan and I and uh, Kaljan Meller, the director of the Bayer Institute at that time, put together a, 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 an application for center of excellence on on resilience and complex adaptive systems, uh, which we which we actually got. Uh, and it was uh, very exciting because it was the only one that was more interdisciplinary. Uh, out of, I think it was two, three hundred applicants, they selected five, and we were one of those. And, th and that became the seed also for the Mistra uh, Center. So when the Mistra call came out, the big call for this big, big new center, actually trying to connect natural and social sciences on stewardship of. Uh, ecosystem services, they, they were very inspired by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment finding at that time when the call came out. Uh, and, that, and that call went to all Swedish uh, universities uh, and, and it was only the rectors or vice chancellors that could apply. So, so, so we put together an application and we, we had already sort of started because of that center excellence. We had the framework and the pieces and we also had fairly long yet almost uh, 15 to 20 years uh, of experience on those topics, uh, having worked with them sort of at the margin uh, or at the fringe for quite a long time. Then suddenly they became highlighted in a, into a big, big effort. And, and we were lucky to be the one who, who won that uh, competition. And, and out of that, the center started and we set up the center in a quite uh, special way, I think we set it up as as a complex adaptive system, actually, where uh, where where you can start things and close them down, where you work with teams and clusters that uh, are loosely coupled and and can uh, can emerge, or uh, if they don't emerge, they they are closed down, and 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 that's the way it's been going. And, and what's been beautiful, I think, with the center is that that it has fostered a lot of uh, collaboration and a lot of collective action uh, simply because each individual working there realizes that if I if I share my ide ideas and if I collaborate that will be very beneficial to me myself as well so 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 we put the whole uh, incentive for people uh, to be part of the of the community as a, as a very strong one and of course, if you look at human evolution, that's how we have evolved, I think, being able to collaborate as a species and, and organize ourselves in networks and, and institutions that allow us to, to function and, and, and continue to develop. And the name of the center, um, was it, uh, did it come naturally? It was obvious it was going to be the Stockholm Resilience Center, or was this um, something you were playing around with many, many different uh, titles that uh, could work? Yeah, we had, there were some discussions about it, actually, because at that time, a lot of people were not familiar with really what resilience was all about. And, 
Uh, but we had a quite long legacy on that. Uh, first, of course, through the close collaboration with Buzz Holling, who was a dear friend and, and a big mentor to me personally, actually. And, and he, he had started with that from the ecological end already in the 70s. Uh, but, but the connection to people had not really taken off until we, we started the Bayer Institute, where resilience popped up as a key thing in all our research programs. The first program was on the ecology and economics of biodiversity loss, uh, I think sort of a forerunner to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and also uh, by, by com combining those things. And, and the second one was on complex systems and the third one was on property rights and natural resource systems. And resilience come, up, come back again and again. And then we decided to, to try to start a research program on resilience through the Bayer and Hollings Group in Florida. And we got uh, quite big support from MacArthur Foundation to do that. Uh, and out of that, a very productive journey started. And, and later it became the Resilience Alliance that still exists, which was at that time instrumental in, in pushing the understanding of resilience uh, thinking, actually. Uh, and uh, so, so we had that legacy, but we also had the legacy of, of, uh, of really looking at people and nature as interlinked. Uh, so there were some people who really wanted to call it more these, the Stockholm Institute for Social Ecological Systems or, some, or something like that. Uh, because because, uh, because a lot of people had worked on, especially on the social side of, of those systems, but but sort of neglecting the ecological side, I would say. and. and and, and a lot of ecologists had worked on the ecological side and just looking at the social as a, as a in driver into it or an impact on it. Uh, but we decided still to, to, do Stock, to, do, to have Stockholm Resilience Center in the name because we felt that that was a really interesting lens to look at the world. And, and of course, I, I talked a little bit about resilience before, but I think the lens is really about using an approach that is more of a complex systems thinking approach where you have, where it's very hard to, to study the world uh, as incremental in a linear way and, and a predictable way. But, but instead you have to realize that there's a lot of uncertainties. It, it's a d dynamics that is non-linear. There are thresholds and tipping points in this system and so on and so forth. And it's, it's a very much of a much better description of how the world actually works, I think, than, than the more linear one that a lot of science was based upon. So the Stockholm Resilience Centre is now 15 years old. What, what do you think of its place in the world? Where is its place in the world? And how, how, how do you feel it has evolved? Yeah, personally, I think it's a fantastic place. Uh, uh, and uh, what is surprising to me is how all our colleagues and and uh, the networks that we work with can combine combine doing really good science all the way from basic curiosity driven science to uh, transdisciplinary collaborative science uh, and publish it in amazing places and get a big recognition of that part and simultaneously uh, impact and influence a lot of actors and processes from big UN processes to uh, what's going on in municipalities and, uh, and in collaboration with indigenous societies and a lot of groups on the ground worldwide. So I find it, I find it uh, extremely rewarding uh, having been one of the co-founders uh, and with UN Rockström and some other colleagues who were part of the start in 2007 uh, found it extremely rewarding to to see how this space has really emerged into uh, an important player internationally uh, and perhaps even to put it uh, in blunt words a leader in in sustainability science uh, shaping a lot of new research directions and shaping a new directions for for the role of science in society uh, i can i can highly recommend a presentation by ursula von der leyen 
the the president of the European Union uh, that she gave at the Nobel Prize Summit, where she really talks about uh, the role of science as helping practice and policy and business to make sense of the complex world we're living in. And she talked she talked about it in the context of curiosity driven science with new innovation and new solutions. And also about what she explicitly stated as transdisciplinary science, which is, I think, an area that we are uh, sort of a leader in at the Stockholm Resilience Center, where we actively collaborate as, as an independent body or independent broker with big actors, uh, important actors and actors all, all over the place in collaboration to to help transition and transform the way we do business and the, the way we do things into more sustainable futures so i think we are we are not only the latter, not only doing the latter we are doing the whole spectrum there at the center i find that very impressive so you mentioned uh, the millennium ecosystem assessment um, and of course, then following on from that, we've had um, you know, major reports from IPBES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And then earlier this year, we had the Descripta review on, on biodiversity and economics um, for, the, for the British government. Um, and this is you know, commissioned like the Stern review um, you know, a decade or so ago on climate and economics. Um, this is a, a major report for governments on um, biodiversity and economics. And what blew me away when I read the uh, intro to it was it specifically mentions the, the influence of the Bayer Institute in foundational thinking on ecological economics um, over the decades, a huge influence, and, and you personally um, uh, influencing the thinking behind there. And then as you go into the report, you know, the first thing you, you're hit with is this, it's, it's the complex systems, it's the thresholds, the non-linearities, the, um, the, the intertwined social ecological system. Um, can, so just, uh, and you were a reviewer on, on, on the report, um, so I think it's a monumental work. What, what do you think the influence of this this report could could be? Well, I think uh, I really think it's a really nice <clears throat> sort of insightful report that uses economic term terminology to describe uh, what's going on and understand what's going on and also what to do about it, uh, which really hasn't happened before. It, it, there have been a few attempts. So the TEEB, for example, the Economics of Ecosystem and Biodiversity that the European Union started earlier, and, and similar, a lot of attempts, of course, to value, to value the role of the biosphere in human affairs. But, but what is really nice here, I think, is, is, is the deep insight on the Anthropocene, uh, that, and that we are completely intertwined and that we are embedded in the biosphere. That, that is such a strong entry point that Porta has got there really now clarifies from the economic perspectives uh, and and I think it has will have a big influence uh, because it moves from more of a, of a standard uh, sort of cost benefit analysis with discounting into much more deeper uh, deeper understanding of, of the challenges and the opportunities and and how you can think about it from an economic perspective and I, and I like his three recommendations there. Uh, I think the first one is really about investing in natural capital, in the, in the natural assets, actually. He talked about uh, nature and the biosphere as a super important asset for our well-being and welfare. And, uh, and he argues that, uh, you know, the, there's been a classical discussion of trying to internalize externalities since decades, uh, basically how you price uh, nature and these type of things. But what he talks about is, <clears throat> is just... If we do things differently, like, for example, create supply chains that are transparent and where you have traceability, that in itself is, is a way to correct market imperfections in the economy. Uh, so, so just by, by reg regulations and norm shifts, uh, you will implicitly start to account for the biosphere uh, if you really become transparent and, and uh, 
uh, open up the way these things are, are, are produced. Uh, the second point is, of course, how we how we account for our impact and imprint on, on nature, and that's that's really to, how how we to modify <coughs> the progress accounts of society in relation to the planet. And the part of the scope, uh, Kalyan Mela and others de developed something called the inclusive wealth, but there are lots of other measures, as we as we know, with Human Development Index, and also a recent one developed by the Stanford uh, group with Gretchen Daly and, and also Steve Polanski on what they call gross ecosystem product that is now supported by the UN and it started to be implemented in several countries for, for example in China uh, and, the, and the third the third point here it really emphasizes there is 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 major transformations basically in several of our activities and he highlights especially the financial sector uh, that investments and the um, venture capital and other players in that field really start to see the extremely important significance of nature as a, as a super important asset for our own future and well-being and, and and also the educational system where not and not just education for kids or the school children but also in companies and in government and administrations to to increase the level of basic knowledge about the situation and and our dependence on on a healthy planet so in my mind i think it's a it's a path-breaking report in that it it really takes this shift from uh, the planet as an external factor to the economy into society and the economy completely embedded in the planet and 100 percent embedded on, uh, uh, dependent on its functioning yeah um so absolutely so you know uh, you know biosphere stewardship planetary stewardship uh, and the long term progress of humanity d depends on ecological economics becoming mainstream so i mean th those recommendations um in the descriptor review are really important um and it and it sounds like we are making some progress with um with businesses um with some in the finance community as you say with china with some um uh, with some countries uh, but uh, but how long will it be before this becomes mainstream? I mean, you know, in economic journals, the mainstream economic journals, um, they've virtually never published a paper on biodiversity and hardly any on on on, on climate. Um, so how do we how do we bridge that? Yeah, it's it's a it's a big challenge actually, and and. Change is happening, and uh, climate economics, for example, was a field that didn't exist 15 years ago, uh, and has now been growing. But so I think that many of the issues are raised within economics, but I still think that the profound uh, sort of uh, new narrative of being embedded in the planet that the Skupta report presents is not in any way mainstream yet but i think i think it's getting there and it has loosened up quite fast now because of the real world changes i think actually so so i, ho I really hope for for um, economics and other and, and not only economics other social sciences also to to look at this uh, new narrative because uh, because the tendency is still, and I would also say from a natural sciences perspective, the tendency is still that that uh, humans are sort of an external driver and not not looked upon as an intertwined actor in the system. Uh, so it's a big paradigm shift we're in right now, and some in some areas it's going fast. Uh, in ecology, for example, I think the first publication really came out in 1990 that really made those points, uh, and. And uh, but now, as we all know, it's all over the place. There are a lot of new journals, and also in in ma among major places like Nature and Science, or have a lot of new journals and a lot of new uh, space for really addressing what's going on in this deep sense. And and uh, we are still waiting for that to happen uh, among several subdisciplines of economics, actually, that do not see this link. Uh, at all yet, actually. 
So this year you convened the first Nobel Prize Summit um, with the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, um, with the Nobel Foundation, with Potsdam Institute uh, and uh, the Resilience Center. Uh, and now we have a, a statement from that summit signed by an unprecedented 126 um, Nobel laureates. Um, what, what was the significance of the, the summit and, and this statement? Yeah, I think the significance of the summit, I think, is that uh, these this view now that we was talked about yeah, from embedded in the biosphere and being part of the planet is now common sense. It's, it's, it's a consensus that this is the way it is uh, and, and that climate is real, that biodiversity loss is important for our own future and, and that we have to become stewards of, of the planet. Uh, uh, we don't, or, we're not arguing about it anymore, so to speak. It's, it's, Strong players like U.S. Academy of Sciences and the Nobel Foundation are now uh, standing behind behind that uh, that view. It's, and it's much more than a view. That reality, I would, I would argue, it's not the perception or a view. It's a reality of what's going on. And 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 the, the statement that was generated, I think, is a really interesting statement because it puts together several dimensions of society like technological change and uh, issues of justice and fairness and inclusiveness uh, together with the planet and the biosphere that we're living in uh, and, and, and uh, sort of try to push big gov uh, governance actors to be, be faster and do something more rapidly about those issues than what we have seen so far. And uh, fantastically, it has been signed by 126 Nobel laureates, uh, both from literature also and from the Peace Prize and from all the other prizes as well. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a quite a major statement and major breakthrough, I would say, of consensus of what, what it's all about. And now the focus is on rapid action to do something about it. And as, as you all know, uh, when it comes to the greenhouse gases, uh, it's uh, urgent because it seems like uh, we already have left the very favorable Holocene era of the last 11,000 years, uh, which, uh, which didn't fluctuate more than one degree back and forth from pre-industrial levels. Uh, and now we're up in 1.2 degrees warming and, and we also uh, have indications that we've never been beyond 2 degrees warming as a species because, because the earth has not been warmer than 2 degrees in the last 3 million years and we've been around effectively for 250,000 years. So if we go beyond 2 degrees it means that we really will be in something very very different and to what extent we can handle that is completely uncertain. And and what I think is very encouraging is actually the fast movement that is now happening on on greenhouse gases. There is greenhouse gases is not something you're discussing anymore. It's really action being taken now. All big players are having goals for net zero emissions. Many, many companies are acting very fast and uh, facing out into renewables uh, in, the, in the whole supply chains. And, and many, many are actually now also redirecting in, into figuring out how they can be a source in revitalizing the resilience of the biosphere uh, through nature-based solutions, through new forms of, of investments in forests and, and uh, agriculture systems and wetlands and many other, other of these uh, ecosystems. Uh, and also how to reorganize how we behave in relation to those systems. Uh, and I think that's very exciting, actually. So my final question, Kale, um, are you optimistic about our future? Are you optimistic we will be able to, uh, societies will be able to rearrange ourselves in, in time before we cross some major irreversible thresholds? As you know, Owen, I'm always an optimistic guy, but 
in, in some domains, I'm less optimistic than I was before, given the urgency of the of the challenge. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm positively surprised by the fast wakening up that has just happened in, I would say, the last five years. Uh, when I started out these things in the 80s, you know, the people were either looking into conservation of species, trying to set aside things without people, or, or looking at pollution or, or resources. It was completely divided in separate camps, but I think the realization now is that people understand that we are living on a planet and we need it, need it to function in a good way for us to be here. That's, that's a big shift into something such, such an obvious insight, of course, but, uh, but it's a big shift that's happening very, very fast now. And that's uh, that's the hopeful thing, and uh, and I see a lot of big actors uh, being serious about it. A lot of actors changing their purposes and and meanings uh, into this direction. And uh, the question is whether we will be able to do it fast enough, or whether we will be able to collab collaborate uh, in in a good and in a good way with dignity and respect uh, to make this big transition happen. Uh, uh, and why why I am am I positive? Yes, I think we are moving out of the industrial era now into a new space. Uh, I guess similar things has happened before in human history when we have moved into new, completely new situation. I think the Enlightenment era was one of those when we moved from looking at the Earth as flat to to understand that. It's round and that the Earth is not the center of the universe, but it's circulating around the sun. All of these big shifts that have happened uh, is, is creating new directions, new pathways, new ways forward. Um, and, and I am convinced that we are right now in, in such a big space at the big scale. Uh, and when those space opens up, it's over, always turbulent. You will get versions that are extreme uh, on different scales, whether it's right or left, whether it's justice or uh, individualism, all these things. Uh, and, and, and it's hard to know which pathways that will be, be chosen. And of course, in such a situation, things can go really, really bad. We can end up going back to situations that are very unpleasant to be in as a human species, not just by physically, but also in human relations. But we also have a great opportunity to mobilize uh, our societies and our enormous capacities of communicating uh, and collaborating uh, to to turn the ship around into a sustainable future. And sustainable future, uh, I also include uh, justice. And I would argue that the, the ultimate justice uh, for, for humans on Earth given the big discussions that are going on on inequality today, the ultimate justice is really to leave a livable planet uh, for the next uh, generations to come, actually. Well, on that positive note, uh, thank you so much, uh, Kale, for, for being with us today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much, Owen. Very nice to hear your voice as well. You've been listening to Rethink Talks, a podcast produced by Stockholm Resilience Centre at Stockholm University. For more episodes, head over to our website, rethink.earth, and don't forget to subscribe.